Uh, we are now recording. Good. Excellent. Perfect. All right. Um, welcome, everyone. Happy World Future Day. Also, the Remembrance Day celebrated in Marshall Islands. It's also formally known as Nuclear Victims Day or Nuclear Survivors Day, for those who don't know. And it's basically a day honoring the victims and survivors of nuclear testing done in uh, the Pacific area in the 1950s. Um, we're very glad that this event can be organized as one of the hours of the World Future Day. And so while thinking about the future is clearly very important, we thought that looking in the past is just as crucial because there's simply so much that we can learn from it and we can use it when building a better and more peaceful and more sustainable world for the future. So officially welcome to Youth Fusion's event celebrating the intergenerational dialogue. Uh, today, we'll talk about the importance of a meaningful intergenerational conversation. We'll officially launch our newest program entitled Youth Fusion Elders, and we will talk with four of our Youth Fusion Elders within that program. We'll do that to celebrate their work and ideas, but also to give you a little bit taste of what you can look forward to in this new Youth Fusion Elders initiative. My name is Vanda. I am uh, the co-convener of Youth Fusion and also a vice chair of Prague Vision Institute for Sustainable Security. And my role today will be basically to guide us through the program and make sure that we stay on time. Um, with me, uh, there are four Youth Fusion members, Nico, Christoph, Arthur, and Michaela, who will each be introducing a Youth Fusion elder that they have interviewed within this new program. And these Youth Fusion elders that are here with us today are Mr. Bruce Kent, Ms. Uta Zup, Mogen Slikitov, and Anna Maria Seto, who will be joining us a bit later. Um, there will also be two uh, Q&A sessions uh, so that you, the attendees, could ask directly the questions to the panelists very easily. The first Q&A will be after we hear from Ms. Zup and Mr. Kent, and the second after we hear from Mr. Likitov and Ms. Seto. So if you have any general comments or anything that you'd like to share with us and with the rest of the attendees, please put that in the chat so everyone can see that. If you have any questions specifically for the panelists or for us, please put them in the Q&A box here in Zoom so that we can see them and we can answer them. Um, so it goes without saying, there is a lot that needs to be covered today. So without further ado, uh, let me welcome Ms. Marjan Nujan, the co-convener of Youth Fusion and the deputy director of the Basel Peace Office, who will tell you a bit more about why we think that intergenerational dialogue is just so important and why we're doing all of this. So Marjan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Wanda, for this introduction. Um, dear participants of the webinar, uh, greetings to everybody who joined us and welcome to the launch of the uh, Youth Fusion Elders program. And first of all, let me start with a short introduction about the Youth Fusion. So Youth Fusion, which was previously uh, founded in 2017, uh, was uh, named as the Abolition 2000 Youth Network, and it was uh, recently rebranded into the name of Youth Fusion. Um, and Youth Fusion is a network, is a global network of young people, as well as youth organizations who are working on the topic of uh, nuclear disarmament uh, and linking it to the issues of peace, climate action, uh, and sustainable development goals. And the aim of the Youth Fusion is to uh, educate, engage, inform, and connect uh, the members uh, of the Youth Fusion to work together on joint initiatives and actions, and just to have a platform for an exchange. Uh, and, um, we are happy to have uh, various um, projects and activities. And today we are uh, going to launch the Youth Fusion Elders uh, program, which is highlighting the importance of uh, intergenerational dialogue uh, because we uh, believe that it's um, significant to have uh, bridges between the youth voices as well as uh, experienced voices uh, in the field of nuclear disarmament. Uh, sharing uh, not only experiences, but also knowledge, skills, 
uh, and pass um, the information from one generation to another. Especially um, as a person coming from Kazakhstan, the nuclear weapons testing has um, negative humanitarian and environmental consequences. Uh, and a lot of uh, people who uh, live or reside in the nuclear weapons testing area still suffer uh, from the health problems uh, and um, like uh, have, I don't know, um, high probability of cancer or birth deformities, as well as uh, we know about the disproportionate harm uh, towards the uh, young uh, girls and women. Uh, and therefore, in light of this, it's very important that we bring uh, the issue of uh, transgenerational impact because uh, current and future generations are going to be still affected uh, if the nuclear weapons are being still present and the nuclear weapons being tested. Uh, and the Youth Fusion Elders Program is exactly trying to, um, to establish this platform for a dialogue between uh, young people and those who are seniors uh, and um, delve into this um, nuclear debates in an open and frank conversations, uh, as well as um, in our um, network, we are bringing these voices uh, in uh, two uh, ways. So first of all, we conduct the interviews as a team of the Youth Fusion, um, which is represented um, in our articles at the website. And we also have a podcast, uh, which also provides the listeners uh, to have opportunity to listen. Uh, to the um, um, conversations between youth voices and experienced voices. And uh, finally, I would like to um, express uh, the words of gratitude to the Abolition 2000 Coordinating Committee uh, for their continuous support of the initiatives and activities of the Youth Fusion, as well as uh, big thanks to the team of the Youth Fusion who are also <laughs> going to be uh, having uh, today uh, an active participation and in introducing our Youth Fusion Elders. I'm not going to go uh, into more details, so I will let the Youth Fusion team to, um, to go forward with this. And I hope that today's dialogue is going to be um, very fruitful and productive, and we can take it from here. Thanks. Thank you, Marjan, for the introduction. So uh, without further ado, I think it's time to dive in and listen uh, to um, one of our first elders uh, who will be introduced by one of Youth Fusion members, uh, that's Christopher Yashik, a student of the Master of Science program in systems thinking at, in practice at the Open University. Uh, Christoph works as a research, research assistant um, at World Future Council and that fights for children rights and nuclear disarmament. So Christoph, the floor is yours. Thank you, Vanda. Hello everybody, great to have you on board of our Youth Fusion Elders launch event. This is Christoph from Hamburg in Germany. In the last weeks, I was in touch with Uta Zapf to publish a written interview on the Youth Fusion Elders section of our webpage. I'm sure my colleagues will link the interview in the Zoom chat box so you can read it after the session is over. While drafting the interview, I was deeply impressed how the context of the Second World War and the replacement from Poland with Germany impacted Uta's decision to become a politician. The great significance of continuous reconciliation and establishing peace in Europe and in the world are more urgent than ever before in history. After two failed attempts, she was elected to the German Bundestag in 1990 and was an important member until 2013. At the German Bundestag, she served as a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee and as chair of the Subcommittee on Disarmament, Arms Control and Non-Proliferation for a record 15 years. In addition to disarmament and arms control, she was a parliamentary leader on crisis prevention with specific expertise on Southeastern Europe, Afghanistan, and Belarus. She also played key roles in the NATO Parliamentary Assembly, OSCE Parliamentary Assembly, and the Interparliamentary Union. She continues to serve as a member of the European Leadership Network and as a PNND Council member. 
Furthermore, Ms. Sapp was a member of Parliamentarians for Global Action, which is a non-profit international network of about 1,300 legislators in over 140 elected parliaments around the globe. It aims to promote peace, democracy, the rule of law, and human rights. In this context, we highly welcome Shasia Rafi, who served as Secretary General for the organization for 17 years. It is great to have you as an observer in our webinar, Ms. Rafi. Before opening the floor for Ms. Sapp, I want to highlight three advices she would have given to her 25-year-old self. I'm currently thinking about printing this slogan on a billboard to encourage and empower my generation. Her advice is speak up, have self-confidence, respect others. Please, Uta, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much, Christoph, for this very good uh, presentation of all things I did. I didn't know it was so much. Thank you very much for, to, uh, for inviting me to uh, this conversation with a younger generation, and I think it's very important because if you don't see things like nuclear disarmament in the context of the broader policies that are going on in different organizations, like NATO, for instance, and what happens in different countries, uh, then you may not understand the full meaning of a nuclear disarmament and arms control. Arms control right now has been uh, for some years in a deep crisis, I think. And it's very important that we understand that the uh, uh, review conference of the NPT, uh, which may uh, take place uh, this year, is very important not to kill the NPT. I, I'm a little dramatic, but I think uh, um, it is very important. And I, I, I hope for uh, the Americans now under Biden that they will support the NPT. And uh, it's a good sign that uh, uh, Joe Biden uh, wants to uh, prolong uh, the New START agreement. But it is absolutely not enough, but we have to see uh, that uh, we really come near uh, a true disarmament and uh, of, of nuclear uh, uh, weapons. This may be a step-by-step -step, uh, process, of course, but it, it is very dependent, uh, for instance, uh, to look uh, at as a strategic concept of the different countries. We, we had uh, strategic concepts uh, which uh, differ very much from uh, the past, for instance. Uh, for instance, some of the nuclear armed countries, uh, they had a no a first use strategy. And we hope for a, a, new, a, a no first use strategy uh, by, uh, by uh, the United States uh, under Obama, but it didn't take place. Uh, at the same time as we had Obama as a president and uh, who was a prophet of uh, a, um, a global zero, a prophet of getting rid of nuclear weapons, we had uh, NATO, a new concept in 2010, where we hoped that they would uh, uh, reduce the reliance on nuclear weapons uh, for the future but it didn't really happen. And we have to remember that uh, NATO says, and even Obama said, and I think Joe Biden will uh, argue in the same context that as long as nuclear weapons exist, there will be nuclear weapons in NATO and deterrence. So we have really to fight for other strategic concepts first. Second, for um, uh, uh, reducing the reliance on deterrence, for instance, which means we have to come back to more cooperation. Uh, Christoph, you didn't mention Willy Brandt as a very important person in my political life. I entered the SPD when he was our star, so to say, so I'm a kind uh, of a, a generation uh, Willy Brandt. 
uh, and, and he was the one who said we have to uh, cooperate. We have to build our European house. And we some, uh, for some time, it really arms control, disarmament, nuclear and uh, disarmament on the conventional side was very successful. And we have to come back to getting into a, a cooperate, cooperative process. Otherwise we won't get uh, rid of nuclear weapons. This will be by building up a, a confident uh, uh, and uh, transparent um, and, and coming back uh, to uh, um, a discussion and not a confrontation. Um, what I wanted to add, maybe as one good sign, we have this uh, new um, uh, 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 treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. And there, uh, some, some people think this is um, not, not uh, uh, a good uh, viable way to come to nuclear uh, disarmament because you need that step-by-step -step concept of the NPT. But I think that's not um, uh, uh, anything that, that is uh, against each other, but it, uh, you, you have really uh, to rely on a step-by-step -step to come to the goal. And it's very good that some countries who uh, have uh, signed and ratified this, I don't think that this hinders others to go the way uh, step by step to come in the end to a good process uh, uh, which uh, that can uh, lead to a peaceful world in the future. And I think the, the new generation, which is now willing to discuss all these things, to learn things from the past, and uh, on the other side, to give us visions of a good future, this is very important for our society. So thank you for that. Thank you, Ms. Up, so much for, for being here. You know, to all the young, especially young women in, in the audience, um, this is just so inspiring to hear from you. Thank you also for um, pointing out no first use. I think that there is some call, rallying calls for that, and I think that's something we should all be working on and looking forward to. So um, I know there is so much we, we need to go through today. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to in invite another of our Youth Fusion members, Nico Edwards, uh, who joined us just this January of uh, this year as a research and policy assistant for Parliamentarians for Nuclear Non-Proliferation and Disarmament, or as you know it, PNND. Uh, Nico holds a bachelor's and a master's degree in international politics and social anthropology from University of, of London. So Nico, uh, go ahead, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for that, Vanda, and a warm hello to all the panelists and the attendees attending today's webinar. I have the great honor to introduce you all to the next Youth Fusion Elder, Mr. Bruce Kent from the UK, who has been an infinitely active and ingenious peace campaigner for the last six or so decades. He led such flagship organizations as Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament and International Peace Bureau back in the 1980s, where he is now still an honorary vice chair, whilst also co-chairing uh, the global movement for the abolition of war. And a few weeks back, I had the great pleasure to sit down with Mr. Kent for a virtual conversation about the highlights and challenges of his extraordinary career that you can all enjoy uh, on your own, either in podcast or article form on our website, which I will guide you through later on in today's program. And during our conversation, I learned that a central driving and guiding factor in Mr. Kent's long life as a peace peacemaker and peace campaigner is his Catholic faith. As he uh, told me himself, what led Mr. Kent to enter the peace world from the very beginning was his encounter with Pax Christi, the Catholic peace movement, where he later became a chaplain. And from introduction to finish, my conversation with Mr. Kent turned into more of a life coaching moment addressing everything from the need to be daring as a person and campaigner to choosing one's battles wisely and valuing our encounters with others as we move through this life. And what really stood out for me um, 
is how Mr. Kent sets an example for all of us that we all have something to do and something to contribute with that will carry a great weight in the large scheme of things, even though we might be unable to see just how right now. And a perfect example of this belief in, in all our capability is that there is nothing stopping each and every one of us from, for instance, sending a letter to a president, or why not the Pope himself, uh, urging them towards positive change and peaceful policies. Because in fact, Mr. Kent has himself done both of this. Just the other week, he sent one such open letter to the newly inaugurated US President Joe Biden, in all politeness, asking him to reconsider the US nuclear weapons commitments and to, at the very least, stop supplying the UK with missiles, without which the UK warheads would have no delivery system. Mm -hmm. And even if this letter just ends up with the White House cook, as Mr. Kent himself noted, there was not a second wasted in his writing and sending it. So to me, Mr. Kent's story is proof of how we all have it in us to live the kind of change that we wish to see in the world. Without further, further, further ado, Bruce, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Can you hear me all right? Give me a nod, you can. Well, I think I'm here by accident, really. Um, Nico has been wonderful in organizing it, but I'm not really by accident because I was running a youth club in 1958. That's before you were all born, in 1958. And the two young Australian girls uh, saw something about a Pax Christi route. I had no idea what that was. But anyway, I sent them off on this route which they much enjoyed. It was a 10 day holiday in France, I think, and meeting lots of other people. And they came back delighted. And I thought that's a good job done. That's the end of, I don't have to do any more. Well, unfortunately, some, or fortunately, someone turned up within a week and said, uh, would I be the chaplain? I was a newly ordained priest. Would I be the chaplain to this Pax Christi lot? So I said, all right, I don't mind, we are chaplain. I was a bit bored to tears, really. They kept reading out bits of papal documents and this, that, and the other. And I thought, well, this will be over soon. But it wasn't over soon. Uh, someone else came to me from the campaign for nuclear disarmament and said, would I join Christian CND? Well, I'd been brought up um, in a quite a strict boarding school where the rules of the just war were supposedly laid out quite clearly. And, uh, and I thought well, the just war was you didn't in warfare, you didn't kill civilians as a deliberate act. That's what I. So then I began to ask questions about nuclear weapons. And so I sort of got drawn in to the whole nuclear business as this my own country here, Britain, was just getting into the nuclear game. So in a way, I've been sucked into all this uh, by by accident, really. And I'm happy to be with you. And I believe in everything you're doing completely, but I had a very different origin from most of you. After all, I was carrying a rifle and a bugle in the cadet corps when I was 12 years old. So I bet that beats anybody else here um, by a long, by a long chalk. What's driving me is, is the immorality and the stupidity because nuclear weapons don't defend you. They only put you at greater risk because you can't survive a nuclear attack, you, somebody else to you, it's finished. And furthermore, uh, hundreds of thousands of completely innocent people are drawn in and killed as well. And the cost is enormous. In this kind of our country, we're busy spending uh, something like 25 or 30 billion pounds on more nuclear weapons. And we can't even afford the health service to deal with the, uh, the bug that's now attacking us in so many ways. The, I was asked to mention the highlights. Well, the biggest highlight of my time altogether was certainly Hyde Park. Anybody know Hyde Park? Give a nod if you do. Mm -hmm. Yes, a few people know Hyde Park. And we had an enormous demonstration. Hi, CND did its mo in most significant. And there were, uh, the Hyde Park was full. There must have been 200,000 people packed in Hyde Park. And I was on the platform and I said to them, would you please hold up your banners? And all these banners, it was like a lot of flowers coming up all over the park, these flowers. So that's probably the highlight of my time. What pressure have I been under? Well, plenty of pressure uh, came to a point where my church, which I'm still an active member of, my church disagreed with what I was doing and really wanted me to go back to ordinary parish life. And I thought, well, I'm not going to let down all the people I'm working with 
Christians in the, in the Catholic Church and, and give up. So I didn't, and I retired from that, but uh, I've always remained a Catholic. I've never been laicized. So people were attacking me through my bishops and uh, very unfairly, uh, very unfairly, but it, it went on and I've lived, learned to live with it. So what are the lessons that I've learned? Well, I've learned a lot of lessons. And, and the three lessons, I suppose, the most important to me is stick with it. Don't give up. You never know when you're going to be successful. Um, if you look back through history at the anti-slavery campaign or the Votes for Women campaign or the campaign for the National Health Service, they were all unpopular causes that individuals kept going and kept going and kept going. And that's the important thing is to stick with it and, and avoid getting a big head. It's quite easy to think you're terribly important because just some journalists recognize you. You aren't important. You'll be gone tomorrow. And, and what, you, what you've done is what matters, not how significant you are in particular. So avoid self. And most of all, I'd say, cooperate with other people because there must be dozens of organizations working for peace, human rights, justice, and so on. And sometimes they sound as if they're in competition. Well, it's, sometimes they are in competition, but it's a pity when they are because they're all working together. They should be working together. Um, I think the image of an orchestra is the best image. Um, an orchestra, you don't find the fiddler competing with the big drum or the big drum competing with the bugler. Ridiculous, they're all part of the same orchestra. And I think we're all part of the same orchestra and we should not be competing or getting big heads as a result of our activities. So I'm delighted to be with you this evening. I was given 10 minutes, that's about, that's about 10 minutes. I'll shut up now. And I'm sorry to be such a boring old chap, but <laughs> I've got a, lo a lot to talk about. And nice to meet you all. God bless you, everybody. Thank you so much, Mr. Kemp, for being here with us today. Um, I've listened to the podcast episode that you and Nico have recorded, and it was the greatest hour of my life. I was just fangirling over everything. It was so much fun. So um, to all the attendees here, please make sure to check that out and all the articles and everything else, because they're just brilliant. And all of my colleagues have done such a great job. Uh, so um this has sort of closed the first part of the event and we're now uh that's led to the first q a of the session uh so if again i'm just gonna say this uh again if you have any questions directly for our panelists please put them in the q a everything else goes in the chat as you've been doing it's very good to to see this very active chat um, nevertheless uh, we're collecting all the questions and already have a few for Mr. Kent and Ms. Uh, Ms. Uh, Zopf. So first a question for Uta. Um, I'm gonna read it out loud also for those who are on Facebook. Um, and the question goes, um, how do you envision the future in 10 years? Do you think there will be more or less nuclear weapons on earth? And how will we live together in the world and this is actually a very good question, so perhaps the both of you could answer it, but Ms. Zub, please, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for that question. Uh, I can say if I'm in a good mood, I'm very hopeful because so many young people are engaging, not only in um, uh, is this organization for nuclear, uh, against nuclear weapons, but for climate change and uh, Friday for Future, for instance, and they engage on a very uh, uh, wonderful basis because they really uh, estimate the values, the values I cherish. So I'm uh, rather optimi optimistic, but if you look at some governments and I have to say at some, some politicians too, I think they don't really uh, have the feeling for what is good for our future. And uh, then I uh, am not so optimistic, but if we really uh, can go on from now, where we have learned a lot what went wrong uh, during uh, the presidency of 
uh, drum. Uh, we can try to learn uh, about the future. We have to learn, we have to cooperate and not just do it everything nationally. We have to respect other people uh, and, and, and not uh, discriminate people who live uh, uh, in, in other circumstances, who relish other things than we do. Uh, so respect is something very important and cooperation. And cooperation, I think for the future, we have to learn more about it. And I would like my politicians who are now in the Bundestag and maybe in other parliaments, uh, it, it just uh, teach them and not to, to look at the threats, but it's the opportunities you can take if you try really to talk to each other and to cooperate and uh, to build up trust. And uh, if we take really the chances that uh, we now have, I think in 10 years, we may be wiser than we were a couple of years ago. And I hope that all the conflicts may be uh, 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 worked on uh, with diplomacy and not with weapons. And uh, that uh, the crisis we have seen in the last 10 years, for instance, uh, like uh, the um, refugee crisis and what happened in some countries when the reg refugees came there will be handled in a very different way because if we live together, we can really learn from each other. And many people know that, for instance, refugees in a new country, they can be a very good partner and uh, be a benefit for the country. So I think there are a lot of lessons to learn from the past. And uh, of course, in the field of arms control and disarmament, especially of nuclear weapons, we have so much uh, knowledge there. If we pass it to our politicians, to the new generation, I think we could in 10 years have a, a brighter future than we um, feared maybe a year ago. Thank you so much. That was such a comprehensive answer. Um, but Bruce, would you would you like to answer that question as well? How do you see the future in 10 years? Um, yes, I'd, I'd be delighted to. Uh, um, I, I'm quite optimistic. I think we have now got this treaty which has now been endorsed and ratified or whatever by about 170 countries, the Treaty Abolishing Nuclear Weapons. It's very significant. What are we doing with it? Are we sending it to our MPPs, to our bishops, to our doctors? To, are we getting it known? I'm holding up now a copy of the United Nations Charter. You can't mm -hmm. even get one over the counter in this, yeah. this country. They're not available. Um, uh, they ought to be. We ought to. It starts, the Charter starts, we the peoples determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. And uh, we've let the United Nations down if we're not actually following closely what's going on and comparing it with uh, what your own, own country's doing. So I think there are many opportunities now to actually talk about getting rid of nuclear weapons and negotiating the end of war. That's not impossible. War is a stupid option and only results in more calamity. Um, and ending war is perfectly possible. We used to have fights all the time between England and Scotland. Do you know where Scotland is? I hope you do. Anyway, England and Scotland were always at war. They're not at war now. They're all one country altogether. And I think we've got to have the same attitude to, to global problems, we can solve them without killing other people if we use the imagination that we've got now and the instruments like the European Union, like the League of Nations, like the United Nations, all these bodies, if we use them properly and correspond with each other as we're doing tonight, I think that uh, optimism is the right word, not pessimism. 
Well, if the two of you are so positive about the future, I think we'll be fine after all. Um, so one question to um, Ms. Zapt again. Uh, what advice would you give to young women today who wish to become active within the political arena? And specifically, what advice would you give to those who want to enter politics in order to fight disarmament? Thank you. Well, uh, I think it's the same in every country uh, around the world. You have to engage in a party because without a party, uh, it is very difficult to uh, promote uh, things like um, security issues, uh, promote things like arms control and so on, because it's government that act. So try to be a politician, try to, to get in a position where you can fight for what you think is worth fighting for. That may be climate change, that may be uh, women's uh, progress uh, in, the, in the society. We made a lot of progress, but there's a lot to do. I think young women should know this. It's not finished. It's absolutely not finished. And the same uh, is with uh, other issues, uh, maybe internal issues, but other issues like arms control. And you have really to study and you have to connect with other organizations. I have a lot of connections with civilian organizations and I think that is very valuable. And the second thing is you have uh, to uh, connect with uh, uh, the sciences because uh, they, they know uh, how, how to analyze things. You may have a good feeling, you know, it comes from your stomach, but you have to use your head too. So I, I have, to try to connect with scientists um, in the political arena, with people who worked on arms control uh, and, and, and on other issues uh, which were important for me. I always try to read enough uh, about their analysis and try to put them into my political reality. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and a question for, for Mr. Kent. Uh, the question goes, what do you take away from your experience of working at the intersections of religion and peacemaking? And would you have any recommendations on how to think or any good practice when com uh, combining your faith with your role as a peace campaigner? Well, can you hear me? I don't have any problem about confining my role. I think being a peacemaker is part of being a religious vocation. It's there, but the importance is that you don't get your religion tied up with your state politics. So the state politics dictate what the religion is about. You should be asking radical questions because of your religion, not just going along with what's accepted as being normal. In this case, in my country now, we've got dozens of charitable organizations raising lots and lots of money for all sorts of people in trouble in other parts of the world. But the religious question is, why are they in trouble? Who, who is causing these troubles? Who is, who is putting these people at a disadvantage? And usually it's the richer governments in the world that are doing this, or the big companies of the world. We sell, this country is selling uh, thousands of pounds of, of uh, military equipment to Saudi Arabia. And where does it end up dropping on the Yemen? Uh, these are the questions that religious people should be asking, not just saying a poor old lady have a bowl of soup um, and it, everything will be fine. You ask the radical questions and you'll soon get yourself unpopular. Wonderful. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. So we're slowly coming to an end of the Q&A, but before we do that, we've got one final question from the audience. Uh, the question isn't specified for either of you, so if you'd both like to answer it, we'd be honored. The question is from Ella Gandhi, so we're sending our greetings to, to Ella. And the question is, 
Um, how do you think we can change the mindsets of both scientists who are intent on producing more and more lethal weapons and corporates that are intent on making as much money as they can? Um, Uta, would you like to respond? Oh, I think that's a very difficult uh, question, but there are um, uh, things going on, uh, uh, actions uh, defund, uh, 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 for instance, um, uh, your investment in firms that are producing uh, arms and so on. And uh, in, in the, the treaty uh, for the prohibition uh, of um, nuclear weapons, there is a very interesting uh, point that you don't cooperate with uh, institutions like universities who are uh, cooperating with um, the production of nuclear weapons. But on the other side, it is um, very much a, a question of uh, that they want to make the money. They want to make the money. And that uh, I really, I, I have no idea because the world is running on money. And if we don't uh, really uh, get people to think more in values than in money, on the other side, give money to people who really need it, uh, defund uh, weapons and fund people and their existence. That's why I'm working, for instance, for the Forum Eine Welt, which is uh, working with uh, development policies. There's so much to do there and you need so much money there, but we really have uh, to uh, strengthen these values and we can um, contribute everyone in their personal lives that you say this is more important to help people who are in a situation where they need help uh, in the third world or at home uh, and uh, not to uh, make money and then you don't know how to spend it. You have to spend it on the right things and the governments have to be uh, uh, maybe forced by the people to change their mindset in that direction. You're, you're absolutely right. Bruce, would you also like to contribute to the question? Yes, Rob? I'd like to just suggest this, that we actually show some interest in alternative employment for people who are working on weapons and war and nuclear weapons. If we don't actually offer some employment elsewhere, then I think the natural tendency, if I've got a family, I've got responsible parents and so on, to, uh, I won't challenge the system. But if there's alternative ways of doing things, but we're not talking about it. It's, it's left to some um, accidental feature or some company. It should be a campaign that people have alternative employments that they can they can uh, d develop and use. I mean, it's only one part of it, but it's an important part of it. Um, if you don't have anywhere else to go to earn your living, you're going to likely to stay there and defend staying there. So challenge the system. Thank you so much to you both. And also I'd like to add that both Mr. Kent and Ms. Zapp are endorsers of the Move the Nuclear Weapons Money campaign, which is talking precisely about nuclear weapons spending and then nuclear divestment and then reinvestment of those funds into projects of sustainable development. It's a wonderful campaign. So um, I'd like to encourage you all in the audience to, to check that out, Move the Nuclear Weapons Money. We'll put it in the chat. Uh, in, a, in a second, so you, get, you can find that easily. Um, so with this, I'd like to thank Mr. Gant and Ms. Zup so much for being here with us, for speaking, for thank participating you. in the Q&A, but also for dialoguing with us so that we now have the wonderful podcasts and the articles that now people around the whole world can read and be inspired from. So thank you so much for being here. Um, I wish we could spend more time on the Q&A, but time's pushing us. So uh, we need to move forward. So thank you again. Um, so 
to all of you in the in the audience, you by now, or at least I'd hope, are wondering where you can find all these magical podcast episodes and articles because you desperately want to read them and listen to them now. So I'd like to invite Nico back to the floor because she'll get you through our website and show you where exactly these can be found so that you could uh, listen and read and um, just be as inspired as we've been for the past weeks working with these youth fusion elders. So Nico, the floor is yours. Thank you very much again, Wanda. I am just gonna share my screen with everyone. Let's see. Can, can everyone see this now? Yeah. yeah perfect. Voila. So, if we all head to the Youth Fusion website that I know my colleague Alin has already shared with everyone in the chat, but that I will also put up um, just after my speaking here. Um, if you go to the Projects and Initiatives tab, the Youth Fusion Elders program will be the very first program uh, project that you can see. And if we head on, on Learn More, you will first find an introduction to what the Youth Fusion Elders concept mean to us and where it derives from. Just uh, following on from what Marjan has already introduced to you guys in the beginning of this program. And here you will also find uh, a list with a short introduction for each and every one of the invited uh, Youth Fusion Elders who have accepted this, this title and this role. And this far we have Ms. Yuta Saps and, and Ms., uh, Mr. Bruce Kent up on the wall already. So if you uh, watch this space, this space in the coming weeks, you will have uh, continuous uh, new materials and new elders coming up here, such as, for instance, Mr. Uh, Morgens Luketoft and Ms. Anna Maria Seto, who are both here with us to, uh, tonight to share all of their experiences with you, which we're greatly looking forward to in, in just a couple of minutes. And just to give you an example of how this works, so. When we invite the, the elders, as Marjan uh, suggested, we also engage in, in dialogue with them. And you will find uh, this dialogue through either a, an article form, which is a more of a condensed version of the full conversation that we've had with each elder that you can uh, find in, in readable form here, uh, including some inspiring resources at the end of the page that uh, address issues in the conversation. And if we head back, you can enjoy the full conversation in its podcast form, if we click on the podcast button, which will take you to our anchor profile for the entire Youth Fusion podcast with a short introduction, uh, including the Youth Fusion Elder series, where you can listen to each episode either on the anchor platform right here or uh, take part in any of your preferred platforms, such as we're on Spotify, and we're also on Google Podcasts or these alternative uh, platforms. And if you enjoy the content in any of these conversations, uh, it's very easy to share them in your own social media networks through just tapping away at any of these buttons. Um, and finally, just to make it all a bit more exciting, we've made it very easy for you to share the Use Future and Elders page on your own Twitter page. If you just click the tweet button that is featured here. And you will get, depending on the elder that you choose, you will get a different quote that we have uh, taken from, from our conversation with, with each elder that you can share. For instance, the quote from Mr. Bruce Kent reads, everybody is capable of doing something, but not everybody is capable of doing everything. But do what you do with imagination and perseverance and courage and get on with it. And that will be your reward, which I think I find highly inspiring from my own life. And I think that is everything from the website, Wanda. Yeah, I think so. Thank you, Nico, so much for introducing the website. I hope that it's inspired all of our attendees to, after the webinar, go on and check it out because there really is a lot to look forward to. And so as also, as Nico has mentioned on the website, you can also see a list of all the wonderful leaders who have, who have accepted our invitation, even if we haven't really done the actual interview with them yet. And I'm so excited to have two of those in our audience here. Those are Mr. Miroslav Tuma and Mr. Andreas Niedecker. So just sending greetings to 
both of you in, in the audience. Um, and this brings us to the second part of the event. Uh, so I'd like to welcome another of our young members, that's Arthur Duforest. He's a master's student in development of international relations and a PNND research assistant. He's also the former vice head of the UN Youth Association in Aalborg in Denmark and has been involved with peace and disarmament at multiple levels and in collaboration with various international organizations and so on. So Arthur, the floor is yours, take it away. Thank you, Vanda. So hello everyone. It's uh, amazing to have such a, an ama a fantastic panel in front of us. Um, and today it is my honor to introduce Mons Lukatoft. Uh, most of you will know him from uh, his time as the 70th president of the UN Gener General Assembly um, in 2015. The Danes and Nordic Europeans might have heard of him uh, from his political career with the Social Democrats. Others might know him for his international support for peace and development efforts, or as a member of the Parliamentarians for Global Action. But I would like to introduce him to you as an outstanding activist for global peace. I had the pleasure of interviewing Mr. Lukatov last month. And from this discussion, I drew some lessons that I think would do him justice as an introduction. Mr. Lukatov is a forward-looking thinker. He developed the, this interest toward global problems from a young age by keeping in touch with the contemporary problems the world was facing, understanding that the complexity of international politics required collaboration to find meaningful solutions. His mandate as the United Nations General Assembly president um, was carried out with four priorities in mind, sustainable development, peace and security, human rights, and good governance, using the newly minted sustainable development goals as his toolkit. Um, he supported these four priorities with pragmatic collaboration in mind and aimed at arming governments with these tools to help to help them take steps towards a greater future. One quote stood out from the interview. So I'm going to quote him now. Intergenerational discussions is always important. Um, as I've said in hundreds of meetings around the sustainable development goals, we have a young generation that can educate their parents and grandparents at the dining table about, what's, about what the reality is. Because the awareness of these problems are for obvious reasons much more present at the young generation. They know it's about them. They know it's about their future. And it's extremely important that young people go out and participate in civil society. So finally, uh, it is my utmost pleasure to introduce Mons Lukatov to you as our new member of the Youth Fusion Elders. May his path and wisdom inspire you to tackle issues you care about. And remember that issues of global scale cannot be solved without global participation, but that in the meanwhile, every single step counts. Mons Lukatov, thank you for joining us today, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. Uh, it's a pleasure being uh, with you also in this uh, evening discussion. Well, just a few remarks uh, from my side. Uh, I grew up, of course, uh, now being 75 years old, uh, in the shadow of the Cold War. We always had the fear uh, in the 50s and 60s, the, uh, up to the 80s, that by accident or by intention, it could lead to a nuclear war. Uh, and as late as in 1983, I think uh, a new wave of armament race uh, was uh, initiated from the Soviets and also from the West. Many of us rejected that as necessary uh, on the Western side. Uh, but uh, there was this still existing fear and mutual distrust that led to a nuclear and conventional arms race and very, very risky situations where uh, the accident was closely uh, uh, close to happen because of misunderstandings and uh, miss uh, the function of, of technologies to, 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 to uh, oversee what was happening. Then we lived through a very optimistic age at the end of the Cold War, where we actually saw things 
happening that led to the destruction of arsenals of nuclear weapons, of arsenals of biological and chemical weapons, and reduction of the overall uh, 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 missile uh, equipment, uh, and building more trust, engaging in uh, uh, inspection of each other's military uh, uh, exercises and exchanging information uh, so that we could build up this, uh, compensate this lack of mutual trust that had been so dangerous over the decades after World War II. But uh, exactly that is what has disintegrated in recent years and where we really must put all efforts uh, with the Biden administration at place now that we can rebuild some of the building blocks of, of arms control and uh, disarmament that was uh, disintegrated in recent years, uh, particularly during the time of Trump, but also that we can at some point engage much, much more, not only Mr. Putin, but, but also the new rising China in uh, mutual trust building uh, and agreements to limit the, the arms race. I'm rather optimistic that this could happen, but we are starting nearly at scratch with the new start uh, at last moment be maintained, with the nuclear agreement with Iran, which is the only piece of uh, weapons control actually made in recent years, being nearly torn apart by Trump. And it, it, the most urgent step uh, to avoid uh, nuclear proliferation and begin building more global trust is to reinstate this, this, uh, this uh, ag agreement, the uh, JC's uh, UPA. Uh, with Iran and the, and the global community. Uh, my second point here in, in this to begin this conversation is the following. Uh, we are facing two existential threats now. One, of course, being the ultimate catastrophe of nuclear war but also risk of, of local wars where uh, some partner would possess and actually use small nuclear weapons and risk a, an escalation of, of the use of nuclear weapons. Uh, we have an urgent need to reinforce the non-proliferation treaty and bring some of the uh, um, difficult countries to a, a negotiation table. But that's the one ultimate existential threat. The other one is climate change. It's just moving somewhat slower in destructing great parts of civilization. Uh, but it's coming if we don't act and don't act now. And that was uh, basically also what the sustainable development goals were about in the climate agreement in Paris. What we, what, what, what we have to understand is also the interconnection between weapons control, building of, 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 of trust, uh, building of new uh, disarmament agreements in this world, uh, and hopefully ultimately uh, avoiding any risk of using nuclear weapons. Uh, but but, but uh, we have to lose, uh, to, to use less money, much less money on armaments if we should be able to finance the enormous investment in sustainability in this world. There is a trade-off here. Uh, uh, governments will be very, very strained first to build up again employment after the pandemic crisis, then to invest as we have tried to uh, establish it in Europe, uh, a, a huge green wave of investment. But there will be a trade-off. If we still continue uh, to use so enormous amount of money on, on armament, it will be very difficult to get the priority rights in building in due time 
uh, the necessary green development, which is uh, the, the only way to avoid the other existential threat this generation, and in particular, as I was uh, quoted for, the coming generation uh, in, in this work. So uh, uh, I think th this is about what we're facing. I have, as the previous speakers, some optimism in my heart that finally we will reach a situation uh, like the one we had around 1990, where the major power, even for the major powers, it will be too heavy a burden to continue uh, to arm against each other. And there will be some consensus that in order to get the right things done in red time, they could re-engage like uh, Reagan and Gorbachev did in the late 1980s. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your wonderful comments. And thank you also for connecting us uh, to the broader issue of, of climate change and climate development. That's one of the things that we're trying to highlight at Youth Fusion. So thank you for, for putting this out there. Um, I'm seeing a couple of hands raised within the attendees. Um, if you have any question for us, for the panelists, please put them in the, in the Q&A so that we can see the questions and, and answer them in the, in the Q&A that's coming in shortly. Uh, but uh, now it is time to welcome our final Youth Fusion member, uh, Michaela Higgins Sorensen, who is a former national chair of UNIA Denmark and a current co-coordinator at PNND Gender Peace and Security Program, which, by the way, we are officially launching next week, next Monday on March the 8th. So if there is anyone interested in the role of women in nuclear disarmament and security, we've got just the right event for you. But um, without further ado, Michaela, the floor is yours. I need to uh, unmute the rookie mistake still after all of these Zoom meetings. Um, but hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for the introduction, Vanda. It's great to see uh, everyone here um, with us today. And I hope that you've enjoyed the event as much as I have so far. It's been brilliant to hear from all of the uh, panelists and also listen to some of the interesting questions. Uh, all of us at Youth Fusion have been working very, very hard over the past month on our intergenerational dialogue podcast. And I would really like to just take this chance to uh, commend all my colleagues and our Youth Fusion elders for that. Uh, it's been so rewarding to see the labor of our efforts uh, finally come into uh, fruition after so many months of, uh, of planning and organizing these, um, these in exchanges. Uh, so thank you for that and really well done, everyone. Uh, so in the spirit of intergenerational dialogue, it is now my honor to introduce our final speaker and highly esteemed youth fusion elder from Mexico, Ms. Ana Maria Seto. I had the honor of interviewing Maseto for our Youth Fusion Elders podcast series a few weeks ago, where I was lucky enough to hear about her motivations for her chosen career path as a physicist, specifically in the area of quantum mechanics, stochastic electrodynamics, and biological physics. Maseto's intrinsic curiosity from a young age has led her to have a highly dynamic career in the International Atomic Energy Agency and as a serving as the as a serving member of the uh, director of the Faculty of Sciences at the National Autonomous University of Mexico. Throughout her profession as a woman based in Latin America, she has also made an incredible effort in promoting scientific information programs, as well as programs promoting women in science across Latin America. I was amazed and inspired by how Maseto has managed to couple her academic background with her activism, namely working on the Pugwash conferences, which, re which received the Nobel Prize in 1995. Maseto is also a strong believer in the power of youth, and during our interview, she stated, when you are young, you have your ideas, you have the energy to act, and you have the impulse to change the status quo. Our role as elders is to support you and to give you advice should you, should you ask for it. I was truly inspired by Maseto's word and her exceptional story during the interview. And I really admire her integrity, her inclusive approach, and her ambition in acting on what she believes in. 
Once the interview is released, I highly recommend you give it a good listen or read about it on our Youth Fusion blog, as Nico has shown us all how to navigate. So without further ado, I introduce to you, Ms. Anna Maria Seto. Thank you very much. I would like to start by thanking Micaela and uh, Youth Fusion and Evolution 2000 for inviting me to this intergenerational dialogue. I feel really honored to be in such distinguished company. Um, this is an occasion to speak to the younger part of the audience. So uh, following up on what Micaela has said in this nice introduction of mine, uh, I'd like to say that if you grow up in a family and school atmosphere that fosters curiosity, critical thinking, love for nature, that shows respect for your ideas and those of others, and that provides you with a broad cultural and educational background, you gradually come to realize that you are not only equipped, but compelled to give back to society some of what it has given to you. Um, in response to a question raised by the audience on how to get prepared to be able to effect a change, Uta just said, try to be a politician, but try to connect with the sciences. Well, I'm not a politician, but let me tell you, a career in science is an excellent way of getting prepared for this purpose. I mean, to give back or pay back, as they say, to society some of what it has given to you, and to challenge the system, and to find ways of contributing to change it, not just challenge it. Not only does science open up for you the doors to solid scientific knowledge, it opens your eyes so that you also acquire a capacity to better understand the world around you, the world in which you live. And it opens your brain so that you get used to applying critical reasoning even behind the lab. Life becomes then too short to do all you wish to or feel compelled to do, to pay back. Besides conducting your own research in order to contribute to the scientific endeavor, you want to work for peace and for people's well being, to fight against injustice and discrimination, to work for the protection of our planet, to help solve conflicts, to prevent the use of nuclear weapons. The list is endless. At some point, and you have to choose. As Bruce Kent has just said, you never know when you will be successful, but don't let yourself down. You are not alone. Let yourself be inspired by working with others to defend your values and to achieve your noble objectives. This will be your most fulfilling reward. It encourages you to go further. On a personal note, I would like to share a reflection on the experience of having been involved in two Nobel Peace Prizes, as Ms. Michaela has just said, both awarded for work against nuclear weapons and for the peaceful use of nuclear technology. Sharing in 1995 the Nobel Peace Prize as a published council member was, of course, highly exciting. Sharing the 2000 five Nobel Peace Prize as the Deputy Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency was no less exciting, but it made me realize that it is easier or let's say less difficult to share two Nobel Peace Prizes than to make effective progress towards the elimination of nuclear weapons. Today, 16, 16 years later, after the second Nobel Peace Prize, there are regrettably strong reasons to continue this struggle, with even more modern and powerful weapons being developed, over 1,800 of these on high alert, and this in a global social, political, and economic scenario plagued with tensions. The numerous treaties, including the NPT, the various starts, even the newly established TN, TPNW, 
all represent efforts, valuable efforts, of course, to reduce the danger, but the nuclear sword of Damocles is still pending over our heads because there are powerful reasons behind it. It is therefore great to see that the younger generations are not giving in, that you have the impetus, the motivation, and the intelligence to continue this struggle. It makes us elders be or continue to be optimistic. I am also optimistic. Be assured of our accompaniment, accompaniment and of our full support. The future is in your hands. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mitsa. So, you know, this whole event, I was thinking that there is not maybe not as many women in leadership positions that we as young women in the field could look, to, look up to, but those who are, are just so phenomenal. And we are just so grateful that we have you and Ms. Zaf and, and other great women in the positions that you are and just in the right place. Um, so thank you for being here with us today. Um, so this um, concludes another uh, little session of today's event and we're now uh, finishing up with the final Q&A. Um, so I'll again be reading all the questions out loud so that people who are watching over on Facebook or here and but don't see the questions can hear them and know what we're talking about. So I'll start with a question for Mr. Likatov. And the question reads, um, Denmark is often looked at as an example of good society. So what lessons would you pass on as a Dane? Do you think the Nordic model can help solving global issues? Thanks. Well, yes, I think that there can be a lot of uh, inspiration to many people from what we have actually done in the Scandinavian countries and the Nordic countries. Because uh, just look at a comparison between what's happening in the United States and to a certain extent in Britain right now with the pandemic and how it has been handled in Denmark, Norway, mm. Finland, little less as successful in Sweden. But anyway, this is an example. This, these are examples of uh, societies where we have a cohesion, where we have a social safety net, where we have a, 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 a willingness to regulate so that the poorest and most vulnerable can, can get help. And of course, it's also an example of societies that will always opt for a stronger international cooperation, because we know that uh, nothing good in the direction we have been speaking about and discussing about tonight, but nothing good, be it on disarmament, climate, uh, fighting poverty uh, and extreme inequality, nothing of that will be done without a much stronger international cooperation than the one we have. And no country in the world, not even the United States of America, can uh, fulfill its legitimate interest in security in this world without working with the rest of the world. I mean, what has happened in Iraq and Afghanistan and other places where one superpower has tried to install kind of stability by military power is a good example of why that is not possible that we need a strong international community, we need a strong European community uh, uh, in order to have uh, everybody integrated in spite of, 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 of uh, uh, conflict of interests. I mean, the uh, basic idea of the United Nations is that when you think about it, we all have more common interests than we have conflicting interests. And, 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 and we should build on that understanding uh, because even 
the latest part of history we have experienced shows us that's really the fact of life. So yes, I think this understanding is broadly uh, uh, there in the Scandinavian part of the world and at least that could be useful to expand to Russia, to China, and to a lot of people in the United States as well. Thank you so much. I think we'd all here absolutely agree that global cooperation really is the key. Um, so a question for Ana Maria Sato, and the question goes, uh, do you have any recommendations for youth today on how to combine their academic ambitions with their activist beliefs and objectives? And I think that's a question very much relevant to so many of the young people here in the audience today. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you know, you, the first, you have to stick to your values, to your principles and to what you cherish. You know? And uh, second, you have to work a lot. I mean, it's not, it, you don't want to change one thing for the other, no? You, you, you want to be a scientist, you have strong reasons to do it, and it's, it, it's a, it's a, it gives, as I said, it opens the future for you, but uh, you want to also be socially um, uh, valuable, and uh, so uh, you, you have to, I wouldn't say you make sacrifices because it's more what you, what you gain from working hard. But yes, you have to uh, learn to um, manage your time. You know? And as I said, at some point make choices, but um, without like, sacrificing your values and your, your principles. And um, I would like also to use the occasion to perhaps uh, complement uh, uh, what we have just heard about the Nordic model, which is, I think, a, a very valuable model for the rest of the world because of uh, the cohesion, the uh, safety net, uh, international cooperation, and we can see what has been achieved by the Nordic countries. But uh, you can also find models in other parts of the world. And for instance, even in, in Latin America with all its problems, well, we can look at, at Latin America and simply see that it, that's where the first nuclear weapon free zone was established. You know? So this was also a good example for the world. With the Tlatelolco Treaty, which has served as a model for other quite comprehensive nuclear weapon free zone treaties, we we can we have served, let's say, um, also to the to the rest of humankind. So one has to look at uh, what works and what doesn't work in other parts of the world, and what is behind what works and what doesn't work. You know? And uh, fortunately, um, the Nordic countries uh, give good examples. Unfortunately, we, we have other examples to look at. Uh, and it's interesting to see that none of these countries that have been mentioned from the good side, let's say, uh, are those countries that have the power, that are the permanent members of the Security Council and that seem to continue to be uh, the, the rulers of the world. So we have to continue to, um, to uh, uh, act as a the, the counterbalance. You know? And this is challenging, but it is highly necessary. Yeah. Thank you for the answers. I might add, just uh, Costa Rica comes to mind as a really good example. It's a country with no standing <laughs> army. That's something to really look up to. Um, so a question from the Q&A. Uh, so um, from Derek Paul, he says I, that he shares cautions, optim cautious optimism on, on disarmament. But the question is, what must the world do to prevent tyrants from gaining control of whole countries 
as it is the case today. Um, so either Mr. or Mr. Likasov, would you like to answer? Yeah, it's a difficult question. Uh, I mean, for what we have learned up till now, there is no possibility whatsoever that those of us who define ourselves as the good guys would be able by any kind of military power to change the fact that tyrants are reigning quite a big part of this world. What we can do, of course, is that we can try to inspire uh, democratic behavior, democratic ideas uh, all over the world where it's possible at all to come in and get give some inspiration uh, and uh, hope for the people of uh, many of, of the dictatorships in this world will finally rise to solve their own challenges because we cannot do it for them we can we can be helpful in inspiration and support and pressure in some instances but i mean it's not that uh, uh, that uh, possible to put much pressure on china even if they are committing very heavy crimes uh, against humanity in in xinjiang and elsewhere right now is maybe easier to watch Myanmar, I hope so. But, but these are very, very un, unequal pieces of the international mosaic. And, and it's very, very difficult uh, to, to give a common general recipe for how to get rid of tyrants. And in many instances, you have to work with tyrants. You have to work Sorry to say that, both with Putin and Xi Jinping, if you should be able to contain the uh, expansion of uh, military uh, budgets and nuclear weapons, you have to work with them and hope that their societies domestically will gradually turn uh, towards a more democratic development. Thank you, Mr. So, would you like to add something to this answer? Well, tyrants have always existed, and I think they will continue <laughs> to exist. <laughs> um, and uh, what um, is, I think, more worrisome of the present age is the tyranny of of money and of the, of the power connected link is tightly linked to money. And uh, I think what one has to do is continue to challenge the world order and to work for alternatives. Um, it, one could say today that not only a few state rulers are tyrants, but also the heads of the, not the, the oligopoly, not the, the big, tremendously powerful companies that today are taking many decisions on behalf or in the name of humanity. So um, I think um, the, the existence of uh, rulers who have or who are or have become tyrants is a problem. Um, it's, it's big of a big, it's part of a bigger picture. If, and if I may, lose, we shouldn't lose uh, uh, sight of that. If I may add one sentence here, because I totally agree with you uh, on this. Uh, Joe Stiglitz, which you may know, the world famous economist, yes. uh, has written about the financial crisis, about the inequality in this world. And I had a conversation with him once. Uh, face to face. He gave me his new book. I said, Joe, tell me in one sentence, what is wrong here? And then he said about America, maybe we only have the best government money can buy. Think of that as a real challenge to every democracy 
even if we have universal uh, voting rights and all that in strong institutions, there is a risk that these multinational companies grow so powerful so they buy the political power in your country. Thank you to both of you for, for your answers. Um, our time is slowly coming to the end. Um, so maybe just two questions left if you wouldn't mind staying on for, for a bit longer. There's, there's many wonderful questions coming in from the audience. So it's a shame to not answer them all. But just to speed this up a bit, uh, I quite liked a comment from Mr. Andreas Niedecker, who's one of the Youth Fusion elders as well. And he was commenting that active NGOs really are able to move issues, quote unquote, and also to allow more focused work. And so that brought me to a question from the audience from uh, Dr. Mikhail Orgel. Um, and this is a question for uh, also the youth. So if, if there's someone from the youth who'd really quickly like to answer, but the question is how to build a mass movement because in the 1980s, it was a mass movement that forced the governments to finally reduce the n number of nuclear weapons. So how should we go about getting youth fusion youth um, to reach out to the global climate change youth movements and how to really build this, build this up. And I'd like to ask, you for for um, slightly shorter answers so that we could we could speed this up. But um, either Anna Maria Sato, Mogens Likasov, or if there's someone from the youth who'd like to quickly quickly give an answer. Well, very quickly. I mean, you have to have your antennas well geared, no, and uh, look at other uh, groups of young people who have uh, similar values and similar concerns and uh, from other parts of the world I think that is very important no not don't get uh, in, in, uh, uh, isolated and don't get stuck in, in in Europe or in the north because you will find people who share your values and your concerns all, all over the world uh, and uh, this in intergenerational dialogue then becomes also an intercultural and inter, um, inter geographical, international dialogue. And uh, that is the way to move forward today. Uh, and and uh, you, 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 you can put more pressure on the system when you become stronger by joining forces. So the, that's, in a nutshell, what I would like to see. <laughs> My very, very short answer will be not that I know the solution here, but up till now, we have been, because of Trump and other phenomena like that, very scared about the consequences of the internet. But with, with a proper regulation against lies and uh, uh, inciting people, the internet could probably be the tool for new public movements for the good and the way to mobilize many more people uh, for climate action against uh, armament uh, uh, and uh, nuclear weapons and so on. Thank you so much, Michaela. I see your hand up. Uh, what would be your super short answer? <laughs> Uh, my super short answer would be to look at the platforms around you, and this is namely to young people. For example, if there's a UN Youth Association um, in your city or Amnesty International, or there's a ton of these platforms uh, that you can join onto and just plant your seeds. <laughs> so uh, I think that that would be my best advice. Uh, that's what I've also tried to do with the making a partnership between Youth Fusion and the UN Youth Association in Denmark. Uh, so I just highly encourage everyone to just plant the seeds and also building on what uh, Miss Anna Maria Seto was saying, don't just keep it to the global north, also plant the seeds everywhere globally around the world. Wonderful, Arthur, um, you have 30 seconds. Very, very shortly. <laughs> I think it's important to keep in mind that there is an entire branch of the economy that is focused on keeping your attention. And once you understand that, um, that 
it, it's it's purposefully made to keep you from being non-critical and and distracted. So once you understand that, it's easy to fight and and um, educating yourself, uh, seeking out knowledge, finding partnerships uh, are all things that you can do as a youth. But also, uh, those parts of the economy benefit from you feeling like powerless. And as a as a youth, it is important to know that this is not true. You have power. You you have a voice, and um, it is important to make that voice heard and and to to keep in mind that there are people that will listen to you even though it might not seem like it is, but there are people that will listen to you. So yeah, that would be my, my advice, my, my take on this. Great, thank you so much. Um, I know there's many more questions in the Q&A, but um, seeing that now is really the time to conclude this event, what we'll do is that we'll copy the questions and we'll ask the questions on our social media so that anyone can comment try to answer them and then we can share the answers with not only you but also the rest of the world anyone who will be interested uh, so i'd like to encourage you all to follow youth fusion or not on our social media we'll try to get this conversation going there as well because one hour and a half obviously isn't enough to solve all of these all of these issues and, and questions so how to conclude today's event I think the one thing that was true for all of our young members when we were interviewing the new Youth Fusion elders is that we all were so, so inspired um, dialoguing with you. You know, seeing your achievements and bravery and determination, um, we'd be honored to follow in your footsteps and hopefully, hopefully make you proud and, and continue this, this movement. Um, I'd also like to say that today was really just the beginning of something that we hope to be a great and a very engaging campaign. Um, so segue on to continuing the conversation on social media. Uh, so please visit uh, not only Youth Fusion website, but please read the articles, listen to the podcast episodes. Um, we can guarantee you, you will not only have a great time doing that, but you will also learn so much from these elders, which ultimately is the main point. Um, again, Youth Fusion is on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, so reach out there if you have any questions, if you'd like to get involved. Uh, tell us if you enjoyed reading or listening to our, uh, to our content and answers to these questions that we'll post there. We also will have many more of these interviews coming up in the upcoming weeks, so stay tuned. There is a lot to look forward to. On this note, I'd also like to thank all of our youth members who've really worked so hard on, on getting this together. Um, so thank you to all who are, who are here with us today. And finally, thank you so much to the four Youth Fusion elders who have been here with us right now, Mr. Kent, Ms. Sop, Mr. Likitov, and Ms. Seto, but also to all the elders who have accepted our invitation to engage in an inter intergenerational dialogue with us in the upcoming weeks. I think I'll be switching the laptop today full of energy and excitement and inspiration and anticipation for what's coming up. So thank you really to all of you. Stay well, stay in touch, and we hope to see you all soon, perhaps in person, maybe um, in the near future. Thank you very much. Have a great evening, afternoon, morning, wherever you are. Take care. Bye.